This week we have a mega special Parsha podcast in honor of the Torch annual fundraiser. That's right. The Torch annual fundraiser is going on right now at givetorch.org. And we're at a point in our fundraiser where I'm, I'm kind of certain we're not going to reach our goal. This is the 10th year that we've been doing an online fundraiser, givetorch.org. And every single year without fail, at one point in the fundraiser, I say to my colleagues, I said, I think, I think we're not going to make it this year. We're not going to reach our goal. Right now we're about 34% of the way towards the goal. I don't think we overextended ourselves. I don't think we took too ambitious of a goal. It's the same goal as last year. We didn't even go up with inflation, but maybe the donors, the friends are a bit sluggish. Maybe they're not quite persuaded. Maybe you're not quite persuaded. I don't know what I need to do to convince you to visit givetorch.org and to make your annual contribution. I released this week all sorts of podcasts on all the different shows. What I like to do is I, I stockpile. I prep. I prepare in advance podcasts for each of the six shows so that way I can release them all the week of. So everyone knows there's a fundraiser, givetorch.org. And then I record a a whole pitch where I lay out my case, why it's so important, why it's so valuable, why it's such a good idea to support the great work of Torch. And I I always pledge to give you a slice of the merits of the Torah enterprise. And then I I give a kind of a veiled threat. Maybe I'll have to resign if we don't make it. I'll sell mortgages or cabinets. This year I said maybe I'll become a paralegal. You know, what other gimmicks do I have on my sleeve? A few years ago... I made a, a very foolish, a foolish decision against the advice of my colleagues, and I gave out my phone number. And I said, "You call me, you text me. If you need me to persuade you, I'll call you and I'll text you." And I foolishly did that, and I'll never make that mistake again. I'll never give out my phone number again. I'll never say seven one three three zero one three six one one again. But the truth is, the Almighty has not let us falter yet, with His help. And with your generosity, visiting givetorch.org and making a generous donation, giving what you can give, every donation is doubled, it's matched. That will, please God, allow us to continue the amazing run of the Parsha Podcast for another year. Givetorch.org, the link is in the description. Thank you so much for your kindness, your generosity, in supporting the Parsha Podcast, in listening to the Parsha Podcast, and in making your annual contribution at givetorch.org to help continue the great work of Torch and the Parsha podcast and the great and glorious Torch Center in Houston, Texas. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. This week is the final installment of the book of Exodus. Most years, Parsha's Pekude is appendaged to the previous Parsha, Parsha's Vayakel. This year, because it is a leap year, we have Parsha's Pekude and Vayakel split up and we are culminating the narrative of the tabernacle. Right after the Sinai revelation, Moshe goes up to heaven, and he spends 40 days and 40 nights there, and he gets the Torah and the tablets, comes down, sees the golden calf, and he destroys the golden calf and makes everyone drink from the water and calls his fellow Levites to raise up arms in defending the honor of Hashem, He stops the bleeding. He ensures that the Jewish people will not be destroyed right then and there. He gets the Almighty to forgive the Jewish people. He gets a second set of tablets, and he returns on Yom Kippur. It's a little bit more than four or five months after the Son of Revelation. The nation is now stable. We have a second set of tablets, and the nation's told to start assembling the materials for the tabernacle. They have this big fundraising drive. It takes only a couple of days. Unlike perhaps other fundraising drives. They assemble all the materials, they hire all the artisans and the craftsmen and people who are inspired in their heart, and they begin to build. And the Torah tells us, Parshas Teruma, Tetzava, Kisisa, Vayakil, Pekude, all of these Parshas, the final five Parshios of the book of Exodus, are dedicated primarily to the narrative of the tabernacle of the Mishkan. Of course, in between the the twin narratives of the Mishkan, you have 
the Golden Calf episode and the fallout from there. But this is really a major section of the book and of the Torah. And it's a big deal. Obviously, if it wasn't, the Torah would not tell us about it. Certainly not give us so much information about it. But at the very beginning, we were told something beautiful. God tells Moshe, tell the Jewish people, you make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell amongst you. And this whole concept of God dwelling amongst us, that is, of course, a strange idea in our eyes. We have a hard time understanding God to begin with. And it makes even less sense to say that God will dwell amongst us. What does that mean? But we have not even yet gotten to the topic of sacrifices. That's coming next week's Parsha. Parsha of Ayikra. The whole book of Leviticus. We read up all the sacrifices, the morning sacrifice, the afternoon sacrifice, and the evening, the processing of the sacrifices. And we have the special most of sacrifices on holidays and festivals. And there are the obligatory sacrifices and the optional sacrifices, the volunteer sacrifices. This whole subject, the tabernacle, the dwelling of God of the tabernacle, the sacrifices that were the processes done inside the tabernacle, it's mysterious and it is quite baffling to us. What is the meaning behind all of this? What is the larger message of the tabernacle? You know, we have this idea of God dwelling amongst us, but then we have, we have sacrifices. How does that fit in? So today, in honor of the Torch fundraiser and the final installment of the book of Exodus, in true year eight of the Parsha podcast fashion, we go deep and deeper, dad, deep and deeper in plumbing the depths of this subject. And along the way, we're going to learn about all sorts of very important things. We're going to learn about the imperative of Torah study and why it is existentially important and critical. And it's more important than anything else we can do. And there's no hyperbole there. That's the claim. And I think that will give you a renewed appreciation for the Parsha podcast and for Torah in general. And who knows, it may even persuade the hardened holdouts. It'll persuade them to help contribute towards the fundraiser givetorch.org. Maybe we'll see. Moreover, I think it will help round out our understanding of the tabernacle and all the associated elements of the tabernacle. If you think about it, we read about the tabernacle and the various vessels inside of it. And there are so many different themes that don't seem to really connect into one overarching mega concept. Of course, we have the ark, and the ark ark is the epicenter of the tabernacle, and inside the ark we have the the luchos, the tablets, the first set of tablets that were shattered, the second set of tablets that endured. Eventually the Torah scroll that Moshe wrote is placed there as well. And that's in the Holy of Holies, that's the absolute inner sanctums of the mission of the tabernacle. Moving further outward, we have the menorah. And what does that symbolize? Well, that's that's kind of also symbolizing Torah, we're told. It's the light of Torah. It's the illumination of Torah. It's when the holiness and the Torah and the Ark wants to emanate outwardly. It's done via the menorah, so to speak. And we have the table. And that, that's about prosperity and continuity. There's bread on the table. And that symbolizes the monarchy. And it symbolizes the fact that God feeds the world. And then we have sacrifices. So we have the altar, the outer altar upon which the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices are brought. And we have the inner golden altar upon which the incense is brought. But what's putting all of this together? What if, if there were to be a, a general theory of the tabernacle, what would it be? It's also interesting that in Egypt, we're not told to build the tabernacle. Abraham was not told to build a tabernacle. Isaac, Jacob, Moshe before Sinai was not told to build a tabernacle. There's a deep connection between the Sinai revelation when the Almighty revealed himself, when he tore open the heavens and he showed the nation that there's nothing besides for God, Ein od milvado. And he gave us the tablets, the tablets of testimony. Right afterwards, the day after Moshe descends from the mountain, that's when the building of the tabernacle commences. There's some sort of intimate connection 
between the Sinai revelation, the giving of the Torah, and the Mishkan, and the tabernacle. What exactly is this connection? We have learned previously, the Ramban tells us, for example, that the tabernacle, that's a portable Sinai. Sinai, we had a revelation, and that was amazing. <laughs> the Almighty tore up the heavens, and he revealed things that we can't even fathom to those people who were present. And then the Sinai revelation ended. And the tabernacle, the Mishkan, that is designed to perpetuate Sinai. It's a portable Sinai. Sinai is over, but you still have a tabernacle. And that somehow preserves the experience of Sinai. So what exactly is the connection between Sinai, the Sinai Revelation, the giving of the Torah, and the tabernacle? So let's begin. And I want to begin by establishing a very important principle that is very counterintuitive. We have a flawed perception of how the world works. The world is not operating with autopilot. The autopilot is disengaged. And this is a very subtle point. We tend to think that, well, the might created the world and now the world is created. So there are rules governing how the world works and those rules will continue until something else changes. But there's a very subtle point that appears in many places in our literature that tells us to the contrary. Our world does not exist and continue to exist on its own. If it were on its own, if it was severed, if its connection was severed between it and God, between the lower spheres, our world, and the upper spheres, this world will cease to exist. And we have a a bit of a misconception around this. You know, we think your heart pumps unless there's something catastrophically wrong. Unless, God forbid, you have a heart attack, the heart will just continue pumping every couple of seconds for 90 years. Unless something is catastrophically wrong, your brain will work. Your body will work. Your eyes are going to be operational. You'll see unless, God forbid, someone goes blind. You're going to hear unless, God forbid, someone goes deaf. That's our perception. It's not just with our body, it's with the whole world. Unless there's some sort of apocalyptic event, nuclear war, an asteroid, catastrophic climate change. Unless something absolutely apocalyptic happens, unless your preferred candidate loses the election, unless there's something completely out of the ordinary, we believe the world will endure. So we hear things are good until something changes. And that, our sages tell us, it's a major misconception that must be clarified. The Torah tells us in many places that every single second of your life, you are blind. And every single second of your life, if you are fortunate enough to see, it's a gift from the Almighty who says, I want this blind person to see. Every morning we have a blessing. Pokech Ivrim. God takes the blind and makes them seeing, gives them sight. What does that mean? What does it mean that God makes the blind see? All of us. We're all blind. And every single second, the mind says, you know what? I'll let this person see. There's divine intervention every single moment. And we're thanking God every morning. Thank you for taking me, a blind person, and giving me sight. You went to sleep last night. I presume. And you slept for seven hours, eight hours. Now it's in vogue to get a good night's sleep. And to sleep maybe nine hours, or maybe you slept four hours. Maybe you had a baby that uh, kept you up all night, so you slept three hours and, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, intermittent sleeping. But regardless, if you're listening to me right now, your heart was pumping thousands and thousands of times overnight. And we believe each one of those is a miracle. Each one of those is the Almighty 
the all-powerful, omnipotent creator telling your heart pump. And the heart pumps. And it tells the heart pump again. And God tells the heart to pump again. And the heart pumps again. And God tells the heart to pump again. And so on. Maybe a 100,000 times a day. That's our philosophy. It exists in the world in general. It exists in our body, the mini world. Genesis. Everything that was created in Genesis, it's not a one-time event. There is Genesis 2.0 every single second. And we say this in our prayers. Ubetuvo, God in his goodness, mechadesh b'chol yom tamid. God renews every day, tamid, always. Ma'ase, precious, the act of Genesis. Genesis was not a one-time thing. Every single day, God in his goodness renews Genesis at all times. He didn't just create the world and move on. He created the world, Genesis 1.0. And he is continually renewing and recreating the world every single day, every single second, every moment. Always. God is, in his benevolence, recreating the world. And that means that if Genesis 2.0 did not happen every single second... The world stops. The world ceases to exist. This world cannot exist on its own. Again, the autopilot is disengaged. There ain't no autopilot. The Almighty is constantly overseeing the world and recreating Genesis every single moment. And there's no latency. And there's no cackling. And... It's seamless. Every single moment we're we're being recreated anew. And by the way, it just happens to be that the Almighty most of the time recreates us in the exact same place that we were a second prior. It's just as easy for God to recreate you in the International Space Station or on the moon or in Florida or in uh, Antarctica. But the Almighty, most of the time, just recreates us in the same place. The Talmud tells us that there were, there were a few instances where there was a miracle of the acceleration of the journey. The journey was accelerated for certain people that were traveling. Eliezer are going to find a wife for Isaac. He travels east and meets Rebecca. And that happened very fast. And the commentaries explained to us, what is the nature of the miracle of an accelerated journey? The nature is that the Almighty just recreated Eliezer in a different place. And that's a rare miracle. And that is a departure from what the typical divine will is. But it's no different when we are recreated in the same place. The, the mechanics of it are the same. And the best analogy for this is, is a lamp. You plug a lamp into the wall. It gives you light. Now, if you were an alien and you were parachuted down to earth and you spend a night in a, in a cottage and you see a lamp and the lamp is lit and you never saw a lamp before, you would think, well, this lamp has light. But of course, we know that the lamp has light only because it's plugged in, only because it is connected to the electricity, to the source, to the grid. And it's really the electricity and that flow of vitality that's giving the light to the lamp. You unplug it for a second, and right away the light stops. Our world must be, so to speak, plugged in to the spiritual world. We have to have a constant connection with the Creator. If that connection were to sever, if that plug, so to speak, were to be unplugged, that's it. It's over. The lamp is extinguished. The world ceases to exist and is instantly plunged into nothingness, emptiness, and desolation. That's what we believe. Principle number one. Principle number two is that there's a certain merit that we have that causes God to perpetuate the world. Does God perpetuate the world regardless of what we do? Is the world's continuity not correlated with our behavior? No. 
It very much is correlated with our behavior. None of us were around in Genesis 1.0. But the ongoing, every second, the consistent, continuous Genesis happening every moment in that we can partner with God. The mission tells us there are three things upon which the world stands. And the commentaries explain that these three things are the cause for the world's continuity. What is the proverbial plug that connects our world to God? There are three things the mission tells us. Torah, avoda, gemilos chasadim. Torah, the study of Torah. Avoda, service of God. Gemilos chasadim, kindness. These are the three things that we do that uphold the world, that grant the world continuity. These are the plugs, so to speak, that connect our world with our Creator, and they contribute towards the perpetuation of the world. And there's a very deep point over here. You know, we have the privilege of studying the Almighty's Torah. And of course, the Torah is the will of God. It's called the Ratzon Hashem, the will of God. God says, I'm going to reveal to you, I'm going to show you, I'm going to bring you behind the scenes and let you know what I really want. Where is the Torah? Where is the center of Torah? Torah is the will of God that God gave to us at Sinai. Right? So, where was the Torah before Sinai? The Torah was in the heavens. And after Sinai, the Torah is now with us, right? So, there's a subtle point. It is true that we are the bearers of Torah ever since the Sinai revelation. But the essence of Torah, the holiness of Torah, it's still very much intimately connected with God. The roots of Torah, they're still in the heavens. So when you're studying Torah, you're accessing really something whose roots lie in heaven. And when you study, you're pulling the Torah from heaven down to you. And that creates a connection, almost like a pipeline, where you're you're making like a pull request and you're telling God, I want to study your Torah. Give me some of your Torah. And of course, he grants it to us. And we pull the Torah down. And thereby, we have created a, a, a link, a connection, a pipeline between us and God, between our world and the world on high. The world must be plugged into the heavens, so to speak, in order for it to have continuity. Well, what's that? What's that plug? What's that wire that connects the two? Where's the pipeline? The pipeline is Torah. Why, why Torah? What's so special about Torah study? Well, Torah study is the accessing of divine Torah. So you're studying it here, and you, but you're really what you're doing is you're pulling it down from on, from on high. And that creates a connection. And through that connection, all the vitality, all the electricity, so to speak, all the prosperity, all the goodness, that the world has, it's all a result of that Torah study. The Talmud tells us that every single person in the world is alive solely due to Torah study, which is a a pretty incredible statement. This is what they mean. If there was no connection between our world and God, everyone would die. Everyone would cease to exist. So how do we create that connection with the study of Torah? That creates a pipeline through which there is a connection and the vitality can flow, and thus everyone is alive. Because there are some people on this planet, some people in this world, some fellow earthlings who say, I want to study the Almighty's Torah, and they're pulling the Torah down from heaven. And they're creating a pipeline and everyone else benefits. Everyone else gets to enjoy the fruits of the Torah study of the scholars. There are people in Japan, in North Korea and South Korea, who are alive, who never even heard of Torah. They have no idea. They don't understand this secret. They don't understand that there's a plug that connects our world to Hashem, to the Almighty. 
If there were to be, God forbid, a second where there was no Torah study, well, the plug will be removed and the light will go out and the world would cease. The Almighty wants to give us goodness, health, prosperity, rain, our hearts to beat. And it's an ongoing genesis. But there has to be a pipeline. And when we study Torah, we're creating that pipeline. We're, we're pulling, we're making a pull request from heaven. And that forms this big, large pipeline. And through that, all goodness can flow. The Talmud tells us in a few places that if there would be no one studying Torah, the world would cease. And quotes a verse, Imlo brisi yomum valayla, if not for my covenant of day and night, if not for Torah study, then the rules of heaven and earth I will not place. Meaning, the continuity of the world will not continue absent the covenant of day and night, absent Torah study. The Abadi gives life and vitality to the world only in the merit of Torah. The verse tells us, Yom Hashishi, day six, day the six. We mentioned this a few weeks ago, I think. All of Genesis hinges on the sixth day, namely the sixth day of Sivan, the giving of the Torah. In what merit does Hashem recreate the world? In the merit of Torah. We mention the prayer that we say every day that mentions this. Ubituvo, God in his goodness, mechadesh bechol yom tamid. God renews every day. Tamid, always. Ma'aseh b'rishis, the act of Genesis. The commentaries note that tov, good, is very often a reference for Torah. Ki lekech tov I gave you a good purchase. That's Torah. Ain't tov el Torah. God in his goodness Via his Torah, he perpetuates the world. But here's the question. What about before Sinai? Before the Torah was given to humanity, when the Torah was exclusively in in, in heaven, there was no foothold, no beachhead for it over here. How did the world have continuity? If the world cannot exist on its own, it's got to be plugged in, and the way it gets plugged in is via, the, is via Torah. Well, how did the world, before the Sinai revelation, before Torah was given to us, how did the world endure? How did it have continuity? So this gets to the big change that happened at Sinai. Previously, God perpetuated the world irrespective of the righteousness of the world's inhabitants. There could be a time where no one was studying. And it wouldn't make a difference. Before Sinai, there was a different mode. God was doing Genesis 2.0 without any help, so to speak, from us. No one was studying, and God himself was creating that connection. At Sinai, when God gave us the Torah, he said, now it's up to you. This is an idea we find again in many places in the literature. It's a deep idea, but that's what we're doing here. It's year eight of the Parsha podcast, deep and deeper. If you ever have the great privilege of reading Psalms, chapter 136, you'll find that there is a repeating refrain in this Psalm. Ki le'olam chazdo, for God's kindness endured forever or for the world. The world exists because of God's kindness. And the commentary is noted, if you count the verses in that chapter, there are 26 verses that say, Ki le'olam chazdo, for God's kindness endures forever. The commentaries explain, from Adam to Moshe, it was 26 generations. Adam to Noah is 10, Noah to Abraham is another 10, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Kahas, Amram, and Moshe. There were exactly 26 generations where the world endured. Tila Olam Chasdo was only thanks to God's kindness. For 26 generations, God said, 
Genesis 1.0. I did Genesis 2.0 to perpetuate the world every second. I'm going to do as well. But once Sinai happened, 26 generations are over. Now the world exists because of your partnership, humans. Now you have the Torah. Now you have the means to create that connection, to, to create that pipeline. Now it's up to you. Genesis begins with the letter Bet. Bereshit. And the commentary is asked, and we spoke about this briefly in the past. Why does it start with the letter Bet? Why does it start with the second letter of the alphabet? It should start with the Aleph, with the first one. And the commentaries tell us, actually, the world and creation does start with the letter Aleph. But creation happened in a few different stages. There was Genesis 1.0. And then there were 26 generations where God was himself, so to speak, without any help from humanity, was perpetually in the world. And then a second Genesis happened. A second creation of the world. And that is the sign of Revelation. And the first word of the Ten Commandments are Anochi. Starts with the letter Aleph, Anochi. The real creation that's achieved when the Torah is conveyed to humanity. And if you count the letters from the letter Bet to the letter Aleph, it's actually 26 letters. Why? Because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And then there are the five letters that look different when it's at the end of the word. Now, if you, if you don't know Hebrew, this won't, won't make any sense to you. But here's how I'll explain it to you. You know, there's uppercase and lowercase. Like if you make a G, how does it look? Well, it depends. If it's uppercase, it looks one way. Like a, like a C with a little appendage coming out of it. And if it's lowercase, well, then it looks differently. And how does a D look like? It's like an inverted B, right? But if it's a capital D, it looks completely different. It's like a, it's a mirror image of a C with a line going down the side. So you have, you have two fonts, right? You have the lowercase and the uppercase, the regular letters and the capitalized letters. Well, when, when would you ever use a capitalized letter? It would only appear at the beginning of a word. Unless you're screaming on the internet and it's all caps lock, right? You just you're just screaming. And you want to really, really scream, so then you use caps lock. But besides for that, it's only at the beginning of a word. You start a sentence, you start with a capital letter, a name, a capital letter, and so on. In the Hebrew language, we have capital letters at the end of words. It's not the it's not the first letter of a word. It's only at the end. That doesn't make any sense to you, but this is how it works. And it's only five letters. Like, you could you imagine if there were capital letters, but it's only five letters, you know. A, B, C, D, and E, just as an example, they have capital letters, and the rest of them don't. In Hebrew, there are five letters that are capitalized at the end of the word, but not at the beginning. None of them are almost ever capitalized at the beginning of a word, and or in the middle of the word, and it's only five of them. Okay, that's just the concept. You have to accept that. And that's man pach. Mem, capital mem at the end of a word. It's not really capital, but just conceptually. Mem, nun, and then a tzaddik, and then a pei, and then a chaf. So if you look at the letters of the alphabet, Hebrew alphabet, it's really 27 letters, right? Because you have aleph, bet, yimel, dalet, hey, vav, older through tough. And then you have the Five capital letters, Mansapach. So if you start the letter Bet and you do 26 letters, you've completed the alphabet and it's time to start anew with the Aleph. And the commentaries explain. There are 26 generations. Genesis 1.0 starts with Bet. And then Gimel, the next generation, and so on. 26 generations until it's Sinai. Moshe. And then it's Aleph. And Aleph that's the real creation. That's the creation that was the intention of God's plan. Where God says, okay, now I've, I've, I have a people. I have a nation. That they're ready for this. They are ready to take on the sacred responsibility of perpetuating the world. 
And now it's time to create the world again with the letter Aleph. The word the word Aleph, every letter is also a word. You know, the the word Z or Z, it's not really a word, it's just a letter. Every letter of the Hebrew alphabet is actually a word as well. The word Aleph means to study. It also means a thousand, but the word Aleph means, means to study. Like, for example, if you go to Israel and you make Aliyah, you'll go to Ulpan. Ulpan means to study, to, to learn Hebrew. Aleph means to learn. Aleph, at the very beginning, it symbolizes study. We study Torah. And this is the creation that God had intended where humanity plays a supporting role in Genesis 2.0 going forward. Thenceforth, the plug that connects our world to Hashem, that's the Torah. And when we study it, that is forming a bond between us and God. And through that bond and thanks to that bond, the world in totality can have continuity. This is the major change at, at Sinai. Hashem says, I did 26 generations of kindness. Now it's up to you. You determine if the world will be perpetuated or not. Are you going to study my Torah and thereby ensure that the world will continue? Because God's kindness, so to speak, has been exhausted. On three things the world stands. And the first one is Torah on Torah study. What's the next one? Torah Avoda. Avoda means service. On three things the world endures. On Torah, well, that I get. The Torah, its roots are in heaven. You study, you create a pipeline. I get that. What's Avoda? What does it mean, service of God? And how does that ensure the world will be perpetuated? So the commentaries tell us. Avoda means service which means prayer and sacrifices. Sacrifices. They play a major part in our relationship with the Almighty. And all of us have a hard time understanding it. What is the, what's the message of sacrifices? Our daily prayer schedule is actually modeled after the daily sacrifice schedule that existed in the temple. We have three daily prayers corresponding to the the two daily Tamid offerings and the processing of the sacrifices overnight. And then we have the Musaf prayer on festivals and holidays because there was an additional sacrifice that happened on festivals and holidays. What's Avoda? How does it fit into this big picture of what our role is post-Sinai? And we're going to spend a lot of time now in the book of Leviticus studying sacrifices. It's a major part of Jewish life. It's a major part of the Torah. And we don't really understand it. Why is there such an emphasis on animal sacrifice? How does it bolster our relationship with Hashem? And what, pray tell, quite literally, does it have to do with praying? To us, it's a mystery. At least it was, until this Parsha podcast. Here's the answer. Are you ready? Our world needs a constant connection with Hashem. We need a pipeline. There are two ways to create a pipeline. Either from on high down below, you start in heavens and you bring it down here. Or you do it in reverse. You start here and you bring it up to the heavens. Torah is a pipeline from up, down. You're asking Hashem, please give me some of your Torah, a pull request from your Torah. And the Almighty, in His benevolence, gives it to us. And we pull it down and we've created a pipeline through which these worlds are connected and through which our world can endure, can have perpetuation. Prayer and sacrifices, it's the opposite. You take an animal, an animal that symbolizes your animalistic self, not your lofty self, not your soul, not your intellect, your animal self. You know, all of us, we're hybrids. We're half angel, half beast. And it's a pretty mediocre beast 
at that, right? If you just ignore anything anything north of the of the shoulders and you just look at the humans just from the from the shoulders down, it's a pretty mediocre animal. And our job is to create parity between our soul and our body. It's to harmonize the two. And there are two ways that, that can happen. Our soul can be sullied. It can be brought down. It could be brought to a state of equilibrium with the body in which the soul gets lowered, gets tarnished, gets ruined. But the objective is to take the physicality, to take our body, take our animalistic self and elevate it and make it more aligned more synchronized with our soul. That is what sacrifice is all about. It's to take our physicality, our animal self, and to elevate it. The word ola, ola is the sacrifice that's just a sacrifice. Everything goes up. It means to go up, like an aliyah, to go up, to ascend, to take something physical and to elevate it and consecrate it for God. And by the way, prayer is the exact same thing. When we go through things, and we all go through things all the time, right? Whatever dilemma we have, whatever problems we're currently facing with, it's petty. It's small. Does it matter to God? What difference does it make to God? That's a faulty attitude. The objective of prayer is to take all those petty little things all those things that are down below in this world, and to elevate them to God. And doing that, we create a pipeline again in the opposite direction from here down below to God up on high. And thus, it's a second way to create that same connection. So we have some very lofty ideas here. We have the concept of the world not existing on autopilot and needs a connection. We have prior to Sinai, that was done by God alone. That's the 26 generations, the 26 times, Tila Olam Chasto, the 26 letters from the Bet all the way around and beginning the cycle again with the Aleph. And we have the ways that we do it ever since Sinai with, with that's with Torah study and with Avoda. Both of those create a connection between us and Hashem. One from top down, one from the down up. And all of this gets to the essence of the tabernacle. What is the main theme of the tabernacle? So we have the ark, and that's Torah, and the menorah, that's the transmission of the Torah, and the table is about prosperity, and we have sacrifices, and, and the incense, and then God dwells amongst us. We have all these questions. And it's not clear to us why this comes right after Sinai, and how this is a portable Sinai, and how this all fits in. What's the lesson for us? At Sinai, the world changed. This is maybe the ideal world. This is the world that God had intended. This is the world that is created with letter Aleph, the original plan. We have to just go through 26 generations to be ready for it. At Sinai, the, the heavens were opened. We were connected to the Almighty in a way never before achieved or since. And when once that happened, thenceforth, there's no more kindness. The world's not adoring in God's kindness. Of course, there is God's kindness. Of course. But there has to be something that we do as well. And therefore, God gives the Torah. And for a while, we had a little bit of a gap. Because after Sinai, we didn't quite have the Torah quite yet. Moshe didn't come back yet from heaven to give us the tablets and to teach us the details of what we learned at Sinai. We're on our own almost, but we don't really have the means, the tools to do it properly. And that's the grounds for the golden calf. Because we're, we're kind of swimming by ourselves, right? But the sharks are there now and we don't have our protector and we don't have the tools to fend them off. Moshe comes down. We have the Torah, and we're also given the, the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, we, we have the ark and the menorah that symbolize Torah. It's a connection. We have the table that symbolizes God giving us goodness, prosperity, and continuity. 
And we have, on the other side, we have the altar and the incense altar. That is the connection in the opposite direction, going from down up on high. This must immediately follow the sign of revelation. We have to really recognize that God's in our midst, meaning we have to make sure that God is with us. We have to make sure that we have a connection with the Almighty. The Torah tells us, build for me a sanctuary so I will be amongst you. Well, what about prior? Why, why did we need that? Prior, we had something else that connected us to God, and that was just God unilaterally, so to speak, doing something to make sure the world is connected to him and it doesn't cease to exist. At Sinai, it's all changing. There's the creation of the world with letter Aleph. Now we're on our own. We have to have God with us. And that's done via the Torah and via the Avoda, via the prayer. And it is also done via the Gemil Salam, the, the kindness, which is a separate subject, how that fits in. Now today we don't have a temple. All we have is Torah. I told you at the beginning of this uh, presentation that you will learn about why it's existentially important to study Torah. It's the most important thing in the world. Now we know why. The Talmud says that from the day the temple was destroyed, there's only Torah. We don't really have any fallback options. We don't have God in our midst in some sort of other way. It's really only via Torah. And that's why it's so important for us to not let up on Torah study for even a minute. And I will add, we call ourselves the chosen people. On the most basic level, what does it mean to be chosen? We're chosen for the responsibility of perpetuating the world. We made a decision when we signed the line that is dotted at Sinai, we said we will be the nation that will take it upon ourselves, that will commit ourselves to always making sure that there is a strong, tight, and continuous connection between us and God, between this world and God. And the whole world, everyone, they're only around, they're only subsisting, they only have continuity, thanks to us. Now, again, if someone wants to join, they're welcome to join. So it's not exclusive. But this is what we're chosen for. This is what we're chosen to do. We believe that the only reason why it rains in Indonesia, in South Africa, in Uruguay and Paraguay, it's only because we pray, Mashiv Haruach Umarit Hagashem. We pray for rain. Because we made a pull request. And again, more broadly speaking, the world exists solely because of this. I think it's a very important way to see the sudden appearance, really, of the tabernacle. We have this whole narrative and the Exodus and sign of revelation. And then we have five partios about the tabernacle. And every part of the tabernacle is, is symbolizing the fact that we need God amongst us. We have to have the connection. If we don't, it's all over. Now, again, because this is the week to the fundraiser, I'll make one more quick pitch based upon the first verse of our Parsha. The verse starts off, Ela Pekude HaMishkan. These are the tabulations, the counting of the Mishkan. Mishkan Haidus, the tabernacle of testimony. The Archaim points out that the word Ela, these are the records, the accounting, the tabulation of the Mishkan, it seems a little, a little bit out of place. The verse could have said simply, the tabulations of the Mishkan were such and such. When it says the word Ela, these, it's this to the exclusion of anything else. And he, he cites the Talmud. Talmud says that whenever you have the word Ela, it means this to the exclusion of any other. This counting of money, this is the only counting of money. All other countings are inconsequential, are not real, explains the Arachayim. People want assets. They want money. They want gold. They want a stockpile. The verse tells us, these are the accountings of gold. The only ones that matter 
were the ones that were given towards the tabernacle. Someone else may have a huge pile of gold in their basement. And they may count it. And they may have a total tally of all the gold they have. But that's not a real accounting. Only these are. And he explains, if someone does a mitzvah with their money, with their resources, with their skills, that endures, that is real, that will accompany them forever. But if someone just has something and they have a count and it's all measured and it's all tabulated, it's really nothing. Because what's going to happen? They're going to leave the world and it's all behind. You leave the world, you're penniless. The accounts don't transfer your funds. Your estate is intestate. It's seized by the government as cheated from you. Nothing goes with you. Or does it? There is an account that is transferable. These are the tabulations of the Mishnah. This is the only one that's a real tabulation. You give money to the Mishnah, you give money towards the continuity of, of the world, towards the presence of God in this world, towards the spreading of Torah. That really matters. That is an account that's yours forever, that's transferable. When someone gives charity, they're in effect making an investment in an account that will not disappear. If someone gives to a good cause, to a worthy cause, that is actually, you think you're, you're ending up with less. The truth is you're ending up with, with more because all your other accounts don't actually matter. This account does. I remember when I was a kid, I seen someone who, who gave a donation to charity and they got a receipt. And I was a little kid. I remember saying, well, what's the receipt for? And I knew nothing about taxes or itemizing your tax. But I knew nothing about that. And this person told me, he says, when I die, I'm going to take this receipt. And I'm going to show it to God and say, look, I give money to charity. And that will help me in the afterlife because that's my real bank account. This is, of course, convenient for me to say when I'm doing a fundraiser, but I think it's an important lesson. I actually believe it. When you give to charity, it's actually the opposite of what we think. We think, well, now we've lost, we let, we have less. It's actually no. There, there are things that are the real tabulations, the real accounting, the real bank account, and there are everything else which is negligible, which is illusory. It's fake. Someone has a lot of gold and the Torah says, no, no, no. Whatever you gave to the tabernacle, that is a real tabulation. Everything else is nothing. Charity, that's a very, very good place for us to place our investment. Torah tells us to give between 10 and 20% of our money to charity. And I can say to you that I myself do this. So I don't feel like I'm asking you to do more than I demand of myself. Between 10 and 20% goes to charity. You reconcile it every year. And you have done what the Almighty wants of you. And you have to choose where you want to give that money towards. And of course, there's no cause that's worthier than Torah. We know that. And who does Torah better than Torch? Who does it better than the Parsha podcast? That's my final pitch for the week. The website is givetorch.org. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your listenership. I wish you'd have a wonderful day, a splendid week, a sensational, terrific, and uplifting Shabbos upcoming. And please, God with help the Almighty, will reach our goal, givetorch.org, to help us get there. And we'll have another Parsha podcast next week. Thank you so much. The email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.